Good morning, Kensington. How are we doing today? Good? All right. Well, it's good to see you guys. Uh, before we stand, um, if you've never been here before, one of the things we love to do is we love to sing when we worship. And so that's what we're going to do is we're going to lift up the name of Jesus um, as we sing. But first, we're going to pray and, uh, and just focus our eyes on him this morning. King Jesus, that's exactly what we do right now. We turn our eyes towards you and all of our attention towards you. For you are so worthy of it. You are so worthy of our worship. There's nothing that we can say or sing about that could fully explain how awesome and how worthy and how amazing you are. But Jesus, we're gonna put forth every effort to do just that today. Because no matter how our life is going, you are still worthy of our worship. No matter our circumstances, you are still above everything. We love you and it's your name that we pray, amen. Let's stand and sing, guys.
was only the star. Now I am chosen. I'm free and forgiven. You sing it. I have a
Love that. Good morning, everybody. Hey, thank these guys one more time, just leading us. So good. You know, it's it's so wonderful. My coaching is finally paying off on the music. I'm you know, getting up to my level. And uh, that's not funny at all, is it? Anyway, but before you sit down, turn around and just say hi to say hi to a couple people around you. Hey bud. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> so, do we have, uh, last week here at the Orion campus, we had an absolutely fantastic Spring Hill day camp, uh, day camp week, week that we had here. Do we have any of our Spring Hill counselors in the room? If you are, are you here? Would y'all stand up? Stand up right there. Can you guys give them a huge round of applause? All right, right here. Hey, I want to say something to you guys. The kids this week alone, y'all going to Mac Avenue this week, right? But here, every week that you guys are serving, these kids are going to remember, literally 80 or 90 years from now, some of these kids will still be alive and they'll remember the impact you had in their life for Christ what you're doing. We appreciate you so much. God bless you. Awesome. Um, we have um, uh, voting results. We had a great, great result on our congregational vote a couple weeks ago. 97% uh, for the budget, 96 for the elders. The only discrepancy was, you know, Ben Shatt. A lot of you know him. He's a longtime Orient guy and a real good friend of mine. Um, I didn't vote for him because he was mean to me on a trip to Africa and we were rooming together. He said I snored too much, so that would have given us 97%. Actually, I'm making that all up, but anyway, it was pretty awesome. Brian Mowry has a, just a short message of encouragement and vision for all of us. Here. Hello, Kensington family. Good news. Last week, we voted for our budget and for our elders, and I'm just so thankful to report back to you that the elders were affirmed by 96% and the budget by 97%. This is great news. You know, we don't just vote to vote every year. We vote because we want to celebrate what God is gonna do in and through us throughout the year. And so this gives us an opportunity right now even to celebrate the move out groups that are gonna happen this year. Celebrate the church planters we're gonna be able to support. Celebrate the global partners that we're gonna be able to partner with. Celebrate our youth and young adults going on retreats and thriving in their relationship with Jesus. Celebrate the fact that we're gonna be able to gather every week together to learn about Jesus. Invite people who are far from God, who need to hear the good news of the gospel together every single week for amazing worship and teaching experiences. We have the opportunity to celebrate so many things as we step into this year. And so let's get excited. Thank you for your partnership. Let's keep going and let's continue to see God do amazing things in and through the life of his church called Kensington. Bless you and we'll see you soon. Awesome. It's really good news. And uh, I, uh, ushers, let's do the offering now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a, just call an audible here. Let's get ready to do that. I wanna celebrate the fact um, we have been working with the Timothy Initiative doing uh, multiplication church planting in multiple countries and uh, the leadership from the area, Jeff Forrester, Terry Prisk, uh, Don Anderson from Woodside, uh, Jay Lucarelli uh, from Kensington. I got a chance to sit in the meeting. We are um, in so many places in the world that I didn't realize that we can't even talk about it here. Like I heard seven or eight stories and situations I can't even, I can't even tell you because it would create such a level of unsafety for Christians that are planting churches in areas in the world where you have people regularly being killed. And we get a chance to invest in that. And just the Timothy Initiative alone, as a church, we've been able to invest millions of dollars in seeing new churches. Probably several thousands of churches start over the last seven or eight years. So it's really, 
an incredible honor. So this is certainly the ways to give. I love that we're, we're bringing the pouch by, but it's just a, it's such an amazing privilege to be a part of a, a community where people give sacrificially and where we're on, unified on a mission together to see the love of Jesus Christ spread to the world. And it really is marvelous. And the, the other thing that hit me, uh, last week uh, I, was, I was away with, with our family on a, a family camp at Gull Lake, and I got an email from Clint Dupin. Does anybody remember Clint Dupin? He was at our Birmingham campus. Real fun guy, partially sane, partially not sane. And uh, he just took a group to Kenya. And he got to be there with his group when they popped a well, when the thing exploded. And, uh, it just, and it was the first well that East Town Church in San Ramon had been able to support the money for a full well because they're kind of a, a fledgling church. But I just thought, that's a legacy that's ongoing and we continue to see that impact. And I just love what God is doing there. So with that, um, I want to... I'm excited to finish this series talking on eggshells, and I just want to reflect quickly. Brian Mowry, the first week, talking about politics. I was really proud of his leadership. I am so glad to be following his leadership. Uh, the next week, I think it was Craig on women, and I was reminded of how with the first 40 people that started Kensington, when we were, got together in, 19, in early 1990, we talked for a full two days on how we were gonna have women in leadership in the church. And we talked biblically about how God's vision for the relationship between men and women was based on Genesis 2, not Genesis 3. Go read them. You can go read them. Unfortunately, the church made a decision at different times to say we're gonna base the relationship of men and women on Genesis 3, on the fall, when God meant it to be based on what? On the creation, on the garden. And so as we worked through that, it was just wonderful to see the team recommit to that vision along the way. And then money. And then I spoke on the issue of race and ethnicity at Birmingham. And it was really hard, I'll tell you, because coming from Memphis, Tennessee, and being complicit personally in a lot of hard things, there was a lot, a lot to seek forgiveness for in my heart and where of continuing to build bridges there. So I'm just really proud that we've tackled this series. And so today, we're tackling a really, I think I have a piece of uh, uh, spinach from the, the quiche in the backstage, sorry. <laughs> Can anybody see it? I can't tell. Now I'm good. that's all I'm gonna think about, ADHD, sorry. Uh, today I would wanna answer one of the hardest questions that's always been given to me, which is Steve, how did you develop such an innovative, innovative bold fashion sense? Is that my daughter laughing? Yeah, it is. That's my, do- that's my daughter who's laughing the longest. And I thought, how do you answer that? Some things just cannot be taught. Okay, so now let's talk seriously about the service. Some of the most difficult questions, maybe the most difficult, are centered around the issue of pain and suffering in our world, right? It's something we all think about all the time. I was, uh, I, uh, my daughter lives in New York, and she gets the New York Times. So I, I have a bootleg version of her New York Times. I'm on her account. So I read the New York Times every morning. And the other morning, I literally went through 20 or 25 articles before I got to a single article that had anything positive in it. It was like 20 articles of just despair, 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 just on and on and on. And I think we live with bad news. And as Christians... One of the things that we start to think when we look at the suffering in the world is we forget the good news. We forget the fact that yes, it's a broken world. And and yes, we need to ask these questions. Why do bad things happen to good people? What is God's role in our pain and suffering? I prayed so hard for my child or my wife, whatever, and God didn't answer. And we, we agonize over this as we should. And today, I'm excited to share with you a biblical journey because I'm not, I'm not gonna answer the why of the suffering. But I wanna give you a unique perspective from Jesus. Andrew Kim was our lead researcher and writer on this, did a fantastic job on a lot of this series. And here's what I want you to know. The people of the Bible ask these questions. 
They struggled with this. King David, who was the second king of, in, in, of the nation of Israel, and he was a mess. He was, an, he was a moral failure, but he was also a man trying to find God. And look at what he writes in Psalm 13. He says, how long, Lord, will you forgive me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Guys, it would be impossible to be more honest with God or more honest about your feelings. This phrase, how long, literally means, God, when in actual space and time are you gonna intervene and do something? That's what he's asking. This word forget means to not just to ignore, but to stop caring. Like I said, I don't care anymore. He says, when are you gonna start caring again? When are you gonna stop hiding, concealing yourself? And then we come to Jesus on the cross in agony. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This word forsaken, ekatalepo in the Greek, means to abandon or desert. Listen, it gets worse. To leave one helpless, to leave behind. This is so heartbreaking. Have you ever been left behind? Yes, you have. This week, um, I should have, should have had a picture of Ken and Barbie night at Gull Lake family theme night. It was uh, there were 30, between my sister and I and our children, grandchildren and spouses, there were 34 of us, I think, and we just had the most fun time. And um, I was talking with my sister about our first, my first remembered family vacation. I was five years old. We were going out to Young Life Camp, Frontier Ranch. My dad was on the national board of directors of Young Life, incredible ministry for Christ. And uh, it's where a lot of people in our family came to know Jesus. And we were driving out there and we stopped for gas in Nebraska. And there were, there were nine of us. It was mom and dad, my grandmother, who at 82 did the mountain climb. I'll never forget that. She was, she was a rock star. In fact, she was here at Kensington the week we opened the Troy building. Uh, she had three helpings of food that afternoon and got a cold and was dead five days later. But she had prayed for Kensington. And the only negative was she ruined her 100th birth, surprise birthday party. She was like four months short. But she was in there, my cousin Dave Twyford, the five kids were nine of us. We drove into Colorado, we crossed the state line, uh, and about an hour into the drive from the gas station, Dave Twyford goes, hey, where's Nancy? I was five and Nancy was six. And man, my dad hit the brakes so hard. He whipped that car around that two lane highway. He put, that, he, he put, the, put the pedal down on that station wagon. I gotta tell you, they don't make cars like they used to. Those, those, those hogs could fly. And here's the interesting part. For the whole hour or whatever time it took us to get back, he, nobody in the car said a word. Never, ever happened before. Ever, not one word. We just rode in silence wondering where, if Nancy was gonna be okay. She was six years old. When we pulled up to the gas station, she was sitting right on the edge of the highway on this little cement block, I'll never forget it, with her little knees drawn up like this and tears just streaming down her face. And I thought, that's how everybody feels at some point in their life. And sometimes many points. You feel like, God, why have you left me behind? This is a, this is a common struggle along the way. Archibald McLeish, um, who was uh, chairman of the Library of Congress for many years, poet, writer, he said, uh, and you can see it, I think, on the screen, if God is good, he's not good. If God is God, he's not good. And if God is good, he is not God. This is a common decision that people make. I'm not gonna believe in God because I cannot believe the suffering in this world. And we all, we're all upset about it. If God is all powerful and good, there's this problem of so much evil in the world. So maybe God's powerful, but he's not good. Maybe he's good, but not powerful. And because of the presence of pain and suffering in our lives and in our world, we get disillusioned with God. I see this everywhere. And so in the light of this, I don't know what I can answer, but I can tell you what has been meaningful to me in the midst of this journey. Because here's what I know. Every single person in this room has suffered, is suffering. There are many of you right now that are at a very, very dark place in your journey 
with losing someone you love or facing your own immortality or some pain, chronic pain, or broken relationships, or you just agonize over the hurt of the world. There are three incredible promises that our team is claiming today that you would maybe take home and really take these to heart. So you ready for them? You ready for these three promises? Okay, number one, it'll get better, I promise you, but it's gonna start a little rough. Number one, Jesus promises pain. He promises the pain is gonna come. We don't like to think about these verses. I'll tell you what Jesus said, but let me start with Peter. You guys remember Peter, Jesus' kind of main disciple, and he was one of the key leaders of the early church. He wrote these amazing words. And this is after, this is, he wrote these words years after Jesus had risen from the dead and ascended into heaven. All of his friends were being killed. And this is what he writes. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through as if something strange were happening to you. Amazing insight. I don't remember seeing this before about this, but this fiery trials, this, this word that Peter uses is the word burning. Don't be surprised at the burning you're going through. And by the way, Peter was actually seeing believers in Christ in the, in the Roman Empire being burned at the stake, being used as oil lamps to light Nero's parties in Rome. This is what the Christians were experiencing. In fact, if followers of Christ in the first century were to come and be a part of our life, they would be completely mystified. We get up and have a cup of coffee. We drive to church. We're, you know, I got my kids and grandkids coming, I think. Uh, uh, we're gonna go to Culver's. Don't block the line after church. You know, they wouldn't even recognize this life. You know, our life is so, so easy in comparison. But here's the tr truth. The truth of it is, no matter how good your life is, suffering is real and intense. And it comes, and the burning comes for everybody. And he says, this burning is the word used when you, when you, when you uh, melt metal. You met, melt metal down to like its original form. You melt it and you purify it. That's how, that's how hot the burning is. And most of you have already felt that in your life. He says, don't treat it as strange. This was strange to me. This word strange, xenos, this is the word for immigrant. So don't treat it as strange. Don't treat it like you would treat an immigrant or someone that is alien that you don't understand. Something new and unheard of. Peter says, it's real and it's here. And then Jesus goes on to say, John 16, he says, in this world, you will have trouble. You will have trouble. It's fascinating. I don't remember seeing this either when I was working on this. The word trouble is the Greek word philipsis. Say that 10 times. But it means a pressing together. It means life squeezes you. It doesn't matter how much you have or how well you've lived. Life is always gonna, at some point, gonna squeeze you. It's reminiscent, Dave, it's rem reminiscent. We went to, that, went, went to Nazareth and we saw the oil, the, the, the oil press where it had this huge grindstone that would go in a circle. And the first time around, it, it would crush the olives. And that first wave of oil that you'd get would be absolute purity. It's the kind of where you get virgin olive oil, the kind that just that you do with your cooking and you know you, you put it in your salads. But then then the grinder goes around again, it crushes the olives again. And this time it's a little a little murkier, things are torn up. And then the last time it's just kind of garbage that's used for candles and other things. Jesus is saying, in this world, you're gonna go through the grinder. You're gonna be pressed hard. And you don't know what's coming, but it's a guarantee. Now, I don't have the full answer to this, but this is, this is Andrew Kim's quote, and I really like it. I think he's right. He said, Jesus doesn't promise that we'll experience pain because he's vindictive or hateful, but because we live in a broken world where sin has infected every aspect of creation, including us as human beings. I mean, how else could you explain ethnicities, fighting ethnicities? I just met with a guy for the first time after the last service, a guy named Jamie, 
he uh, was a missionary in Europe for 30 years, and he worked for 12 years in Belfast during the Troubles. And he, with a group of people, started a youth group at the center of the IRA headquarters. And they ended up with this, one of the two largest Christian youth ministries in Ireland. At the heart of the most desperate pain along the way. But he said, everywhere you look, you could see where sin has infected our relationships. I see this in Kenya, growing up as a boy, where the tribal groups, so similar, still were so against each other. That's why the Polka now are working among the Karamajong and the Taposa tribe and, the, and seeing God do something incredible where it's only been hatred for thousands of years. And so as a result, we see that we're susceptible to disease, natural disasters. We see the wars. We see the hurt. And for, but this is interesting to me. For so many people, Jesus and suffering just are incompatible. It's like I can't believe in Jesus because of the suffering in the world. Um, it's a lot like this. A lot, a, lot, a lot of us think this. It's a lot like wearing socks with sandals. I mean, who does this? You know, and uh, actually my, my son-in-law, Daniel Zott, does it. He's sitting right there. In the, I won't point him out, but he's on the second row and he has really long hair. Uh, but other than that, he's completely incognito. But a lot of us just want to say, hey, stop it. You're hurting people. It just doesn't make sense. That's how people feel seriously about Jesus and suffering. And I've shared this many times here in our other campuses. I don't know why I did it, because it's not in the Bible, but in my early life when I decided to go into ministry and to serve Christ, Paul and I got married. I remember making this deal with God. And I made this deal. I like, God, I'm going to serve you, and everything is going to turn out great. My kids are going to love you. I'm going to have a great marriage. I'm going to get promotion after promotion. People are going to appreciate me, right? Everything's going to go perfect. And I, I'm embarrassed to admit all the years I was leading Kensington, in the back of my mind, I think, you know, I got, a, I got a contract. I got a deal. And then in my early, I think it was my early 50s, I just felt like the Lord said to me, Steve, you never looked at the, never looked at the bottom of that contract, did you? And I'm like, nope. He goes, well, you signed it. I didn't. I didn't sign your contract. See, the only contract I had is you follow me. I'll sign that. You follow me. That's it. There's no other contract. That means we're never, that means there's no contract that says you're going to be immune from pain and suffering, that the people you love and the life you love isn't going to, going to die or go away. Because we know this is how life works. But here's what's amazing. It doesn't matter when the pain comes, especially death and loss. And believe me, leading this church, I've I've done hundreds of funerals of people I love here. It never gets easier. It gets harder because it's people you love, people you've lived your life with, you've journeyed with, you've sacrificed with. But here's what, what's so crazy about it is every time it comes as a shock. Laying at my mother's bedside a year and a half ago, you know, for, 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 for months and weeks, I knew she was going to die. And at the end, she's in the bed for the last 36 hours of her life. And I told my brother, I said, she's never getting out of this bed. I knew it. I sat there for 36, most of 36 hours. Still, when that last breath came, it's a shock. You know why? Because we weren't made for that. If the Bible's true, we weren't made to die. We weren't built to die. We were built to live. We were built to share life forever. But sin and heartbreak have entered the world and we shake our fist at God. And we're always surprised. Even though Jesus said, in this life, you're gonna have trouble. When Jesus was on this earth, he was betrayed by his closest friends and experienced incredible loss of people hated him, so they tortured him to death. If you are a follower of Jesus, or if you are thinking about giving Jesus Christ your life, who do you serve? You serve the one who was scarred and pierced and smashed and nailed and spit on and rejected and struck and ridiculed. And he is the one who lovingly says to you, follow me. 
Just follow me. It's beautiful. It's incredible. So Jesus promises pain. This is where it's going to get better. But he also promises his presence. I think what changes for people as they begin to walk with Jesus is that Jesus doesn't say, yeah, you're going to be experiencing pain, but he says, I'm going to be with you in the midst of whatever it is that you're experiencing. Most of you would know some of this from Psalm 23. Psalm 23, raise your hand. You know it? No, no pieces of Psalm 23? You've heard it at funerals? He makes me lie down in green pastures. This is David's talking about God. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. I'd love to do a word study with you of every one of these words because they're so cool. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, some of you know that as what? When you, when you learn that as a kid. Even though when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, this is the darkest valley. I will fear no evil for you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they come from me. I don't ever remember looking this up or remembering it, but the, this, this valley, this shadow of death, this is the, the Hebrew word salmavet, and this word where we get the darkest valley, but it means deep darkness. And as I was thinking about this message this week, I thought there are hundreds of people at Kensington, hundreds of people right now watching me on the stream. There are people at all of our campuses, and there are hundreds and hundreds of us are at a place of deep darkness. And we're like, God, where are you? And he's saying, I'm right here. I'm here. I'm with you. Jesus is saying, there's nothing that you've ever gone through that, that he hasn't experienced or faced. And I love it where David, I don't remember seeing this before. He goes from talking about God to talking to God, right? He leads me. He refreshes me. He, he guides me. And then he goes, you are with me. It's pretty cool. I love it when people talk honestly with God. Uh, this week at Gull Lake, uh, my nephew, Drew Holcomb, some of you might know his music, Drew Holcomb and the Neighbors. Uh, it's a popular kind of Americana band out of Nashville. And then his wife, Ellie Holcomb. Some of you, anybody go to the Lauren Daigle, Ellie Holcomb? Ellie opened for Lauren Daigle. Some of you did that. Uh, I had a bunch of y'all texting me as I was going backstage to... Paul and I were going back to hang out with Ellie backstage. We kind of were waving to the crowd. <laughs> but in the early years of Kensington, Drew was just grinding out, trying to make a living, trying to, trying to create a name. And he, his uh, Peugeot station wagon had 370,000 miles on it. But he'd come up, sing on the weekends in Kensington and sell, sell CDs. It's kind of funny. Making a living. But we'd always ask him to sing some pretty hard stuff. And I remember two of my favorite memories. Uh, one of them is when he sang uh, Johnny Cash version of Nine Inch Nails, Hurt. He sang that on a weekend. I'll never forget that weekend. People were, we were just being honest with the, the hardness of life. I remember Johnny Cash singing that and singing, everybody, uh, everybody you love leaves you in the end, right? It's this, this, this grappling honestly with God. And then I I kind of sort of forgotten the other one, but I remember another time he came, we had him sing Dear God by Ecstasy. Anybody remember that song? Dear God, this is back when we were a little, we, we, we took a lot more risks back in those days, I think. We'll, we'll do that again. He says, Dear God, hope you get the letter, and I pray you can make it better down here. I don't mean a big reduction in the price of beer, but all the people that you made in your image see them starving on their feet because they don't get enough to eat from God. I can't believe in you. Dear God, sorry to disturb you, but I feel that I should be heard loud and clear. We all need a big reduction, the amount of tears, and all the people that you made in your own image see them fighting in the street because they can't make opinions meet about God. I can't believe in you. I won't believe in heaven and hell, no saints, no sinners, no devil, as well, no pearly gates, no thorny crown. You're always letting us humans down. The wars you bring, the babes you drown, those lost at sea and never found, and it's the same the whole world round. The, the hurt I see helps to compound. And if you're up there, you'll perceive that my heart's here upon my sleeve. If there's one thing I don't believe in, it's you, God. I'll never, Drew reminded me of that. I thought there was a moment where 
God invites you to be present. And he invites you to yell at him. And I just pray that as you, you grapple, as you yell, that you hear the still small voice of him saying, I'm here. And I weep with you. And I see that. You say, well, why don't you wave it all? Why do you not wave a magic wand? I didn't share this in the last service, but I thought, when you raise your children, there's a certain point where you have to let your children fall. You gotta let them skin their knee and bump their head. It's terrifying as a parent, and it's worse as a grandparent because you don't have the nerves anymore. You're like, oh, there they go. I'm no help. But God wants you to cry out because he's there. Look at Psalm 23 again one more time. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I'll fear no evil. You're with me. Andrew Kim, in writing this message, told a story I don't remember him sharing before. Three years ago, uh, three and a half years ago, when Eliana, their oldest, was eight, Mia, their, little, their love child, she's, she was one, their surprise third baby. Uh, Andrew and Robin were out at a, uh, having a, a date night and they had a babysitter, and when it came time for bed, Mia got in her crib and she would not be consoled. She was one, she was frightened, she was missing her mom, dad, and crying, and whatever, and so Andrew and Robin kind of ended their home, or ended their night early to come home, and when they got home, everything was quiet. And they walked into Mia's room, and they found that Eliana had crawled up into the crib, gotten into the crib with her little sister, and was holding her with her arms wrapped around her, and they were both dead asleep. This is the picture of the love of Christ. He crawls into our darkest places. He's not standing out there untouched, impervious. The Bible says he was tempted in all ways like we were, yet he didn't sin, he didn't fail. And it says he's not the kind of, he's not the kind of God or the kind of high priest that is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but he's known every temptation, every hurt we've experienced. He promises his presence. The last one is this, and I love this. Are you good for one more? This is so good. And Andrew, I love Andrew creating this little pain promise. I mean, uh, pain, presence, paradise. Promise of pain, promise of presence, promise of paradise. If anyone understands pain and suffering outside of Jesus in the Bible, it was the Apostle Paul. He has a whole chapter in Corinthians of how he was suffered, beaten, shipwrecked, thrown in jail, bitten by a poisonous snake, stoned, stoned and left for dead, and the list goes beaten horribly, all that. Yet the attitude he had wasn't one of complaint, but of joy. It's weird. How could that be? How could that be? This is how. Romans 8, he says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship. I know most of you are not gonna understand that. What does that mean? That means that whole idea of adoption, the Greek word, heuthesia, it means the full adoption of the future life when what Jesus promises will one day all come true. This adoption that he talks about in Revelation when it says, when we see him, we'll be like him. In, uh, in Corinthians, it says, um, it says in Revelation, the, that moment where there's gonna be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. What's the old order? The old order is the suffering of this life. It's the brokenness of this life. And Jesus says in Revelation 21, he says, behold, I'm making everything new. You realize how great news that is, Dennis? Get your old, get your old joints back in shape there, bud. Man, you and I, we're feeling that. But waiting for this adoption, this redemption, this renovation of our bodies. And he goes on to say, for in this hope we're saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. For who hopes for what they already have? If we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. And I would say that's an important part of our journey with Christ. We have to wait patiently when we don't see things working out. We don't understand. We'll never understand most of the suffering that we see. But we groan. And what's interesting, this word systenazo in the Greek, this word groan, 
It means to groan together. I've never tried this before. Let's do it. Let's all, on the count of three, groan together. Ready? Three. Oh. Probably never do it again either. But you know, when you groan together, there's something unreal about that. Um, Saturday night, uh, two weeks ago, two weeks ago yesterday, our beloved dog, um, when we were going to our, our, one of our daughters and her family were taking pizza, our dog jumped out of the car and had a heart attack and a stroke right in front of the kids and us. And we just love this dog. Man, I'm kind of feeling guilty how much we loved it because even while the dog was, our dog was dying, we could hear all the sirens all over Rochester from the splash pad shooting, same time, two weeks ago. And we were weeping for our dog and I, I felt like the Lord said, Steve, why aren't you weeping harder for the people who were shot? Like, I don't mind you loving your dog, but I want you to love people more, you know? And so we're there and probably an hour, maybe two hours after, afterwards, we, Paul and I were at the vet emergency and we were holding George as we put him to sleep and we were just weeping and sobbing over our beloved dog. And, and then Nancy had us come back over to, to have a funeral service in the backyard next to our, our last dog, Lewis, that we all love so much. And all the grandkids came and we wailed. You would, you would I mean, it's incredible because God's put this longing in our heart to belong to each other. And he's put a longing in our hearts for eternity. And it, it doesn't matter when death comes. It always comes as a shock. And so we groan. And we groan and we struggle. But he goes on to say, we wait for this adoption, this redemption of our bodies. It's amazing. And he likens it to childbirth. How many of you, uh, how many of you women are able to remember the birth of your first child? Just, could you remember that? I certainly remember the birth of my first child. It was very traumatic for me. It was so hard. <laughs> Thinking back on that night, uh, September midnight, September 5th, 1985, I had just spent, uh, the new neighbors had moved into the apartment complex in Vernon Hills. We were in seminary, Trinity Seminary in Chicago. And uh, we had 90, 90 degree day and we'd been moving luggage up, up these super steep, step, super steep steps. And I'd gone to bed and uh, at midnight, just after midnight, Paula wakes me up and she goes, my water broke. I'm like, okay, what does that mean? Well, we need to go to the hospital. Okay. I put my shoes on, grab my keys. I'm walking out to the car and she, this is the truth. She goes, you might want to put a pair of pants on. Just imagine me, I would have shown up at the hospital in a pair of boxers and a t-shirt with my tennis shoes. And so we got there. And by the way, some of you that are, have kids younger, say if you're in your 30s and 40s, you've had kids. Uh, you gotta realize, back then, if you didn't do a Lamaze class, you were like considered a less than human. And you go to the Lamaze class and they tell, all, they tell us all how glorious childbirth is. It's a beautiful thing. And, uh, and you husbands, your goal in coaching and breathing is gonna be really important. <laughs> oh yeah. So we get there and Paula revisits our meal that we'd had a few hours earlier. And, and then this is, uh, and then she started going into really hard labor. And then I'm not sure, but I think it actually happened. Her head swung around at 360 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> maybe not, maybe it didn't happen, but I'm like, honey, come on now, you gotta do your breathing. She's like, will you shut up? <laughs> so for the rest of the time, I didn't say a word. The doctor earlier said, hey, we have 10 student nurses who would like to watch through the window, watch the birth. And so I'm sitting up by Paula and, and I'm about to pass out and I'm looking through the window at the 10 student nurses and they're all like this. I'm pretty sure all 10 of them retired from nursing that day. It was terrible. And uh, I've been thinking of a class action suit, suit against the Lamaze trainers. If anybody'd like to join me. 
And I tell you, when Lindy was born, she's right there. And I always, I say I shouldn't because she's such an amazing woman, but I, she was pitiful. Man, it was, I'm like, wow. And I remember this unbelievable sense of, man, I'm gonna take care of you. I'm gonna protect you. Like, wow, it's unbelievable. And we couldn't even celebrate. We were so traumatized by the birth. And about two hours in, we started, started feeling the joy. Uh, I recovered a little faster than Paula did. <laughs> but that's what, that's, what, that's what heaven is. That's what we're waiting for. When we see Jesus face to face and he's gonna wipe every tear from our eyes, things are gonna be made new. This is why we can do, could do also what Paul says in Corinthians, where he says, therefore, in 2 Corinthians 4, we don't lose heart. This word lose heart, this lose heart means ekakeo, which means to be utterly spiritless, to be wearied out. It's like, like every last ounce of energy has been sucked out of your life. He says, don't lose heart, don't let that happen. Because outwardly, we're wasting away. Those of you that are young, you don't even understand this. You can't understand this when you're 15 or you're 20. But over the course of time, you realize, wow, I'm fading. I remember Paul and I attended, a, when our kids were in high school, we went to a teacher's, teacher-student thing at Adams and we, and we walked through the building. We were there for about an hour and a half. And when we got in the car, we said, boy, that was weird. You know, if we were being accused of murder and we said we were at Adams for the last hour and a half, no one would be able to testify that we'd been there because nobody saw us. We had reached, in that high school, we'd reached the age of invisibility. You remember that moment as a parent? You travel through the world, nobody even sees you. Like if I wear a hat and keep my mouth shut, I'm invisible. I'm like the invisible man now. It's fun. We wait, we're wasting away. But inwardly, we're being renewed day by day. Like for me, I was tell, telling guys on the Israel trip last year, I said, all these guys were saying, man, I just want to learn to love Jesus more. And I said, you know what, guys? I don't want to be irreverent. I said, forget about how much you love Jesus. It's irrelevant. Think about how much Jesus loves you. Now that really, that matters. You're trying to think how much you love God. That's a performance thing where you get on a treadmill like, gosh, I gotta show God how much I love him. How about just soak in and let his renewal be renewed day by day by his love because it's achieving something incredible in our lives. He says our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. I thought about doing this and I didn't do it. I should have done it. I was gonna get a ball of string and I was gonna have some, a guy on the front row run it outside the outside the lobby doors, and then I was gonna get you, I would've gotten you, and I'd have you run that string out the side, out the back door, out the back of the church, and just keep running until you fell down that ditch back there. <laughs> and I was gonna, and I was gonna take one little, little circular stickum on this string, and I was gonna put it right here. And I'd say, this is eternity past, and that's eternity present going in the future. And our life is like this little, this little sticky circle right here. It's so short. Paul's saying this brief moment really matters. It really matters how we live, what we choose. It matters that we keep our eyes on Jesus Christ, but it's such a short time. Don't lose heart. These light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal, eternal glory all into forever that far outweighs them all. Don't lose heart. Be renewed. Find new strength and vigor, vigor in Christ. And this thing says, says it's not what you can see. It's not something we can see. If you're only seeing what you see, if, it, if you only read the New York Times headlines every day, it's gonna be nothing but despair. But God has promised us a life which is forever. And the older I get, the more beautiful the dream is. The more suffering I see, I long for the day when Jesus makes everything new. Because life with God goes on forever. C.S. Lewis described, uh, he says, life is simply the title and cover page of the great adventure God has written for us. Do you catch that? Life, your life is simply the title and the cover page for the great adventure that God has planned for you. It goes on forever. And when you understand that, you can face suffering. You can face your death. 
You can see the most unfair things in the world. You can find hope. You can work for justice and for the end of hatred between peoples because you know that God is gonna be doing it anyway. So not, why not us work on it now? When we choose to fix our eyes on that future, it changes the way we live in the present. I really think that's true because in the end, we know the story ends well. We have hope along the way. I wanna finish today with a beautiful story of a fantastic woman, one of the really, really great persons in the, the Kensington history. We've had so many great people, but she's certainly in my Hall of Fame, incredible woman. I want you to see her life, and her story, because she, her life was a beacon of hope, light and love for everybody that encountered her. Let's see her story. As a giving, loving person, beautiful lady too, people who would meet her had no idea she was sick. She's always had a smile on her face. She was always seemed happy, even though she was you know, dying inside. In 2015, Stephanie said, do you mind if I quit working? I go, Please do, you spend more time with me and so on and then. So she became a Stephen minister and she was doing hospice volunteering at Beaumont and, and she just had a heart for caring for people. And then in 2017, she went on a woman's mission trip to Nepal and in India. She was thinking, oh, I want to go help the, those girls that are uh, trafficked. And on the way back, they stopped in India. Well, she fell in love with those kids. And then 2020 came along. That was a big year. We moved into this, our current house here, and uh, things started changing. She had a colonoscopy. And while it wasn't definitive, there was some cloudiness up around the curve in her colon. In early June, she was able to get her CT scan and then, okay, there's something there, only it was in her liver. We've now got to have a liver biopsy. So she got a liver biopsy. And uh, that came back and the oncologist called us in and uh, gave us the bad news that it was not curable. He thought he could treat it for a while. And he walked out of the room so we could uh, basically cry. That went on, and as COVID kind of let up, anyway, things started getting back to normal. Uh, Stephanie uh, joined the prayer team at church. And so e even if it was on a bad weekend, she would try and get there and pray for others. She also wanted to have a small group for cancer. So she started one, because Kensington didn't have one. I'm out here watching TV or reading a book, and I'd hear this uproarious laughter back there. And uh, I looked at her and said, can you tell me what's so funny? And she said, she looked at me and smiled and said, you wouldn't understand. Anyway, this we went on for another three years. She had to have a surgery, and she's in the operating room, and the surgeon and all the nurses and everybody's in there, and she said, can I pray for us? And so she was praying for them. In early November, the doctor had us in and said, you guys may want to contact hospice. So hospice showed up here on November 14th. They gave us a stronger medicine called fentanyl. When I gave her the first fentanyl patch, I laid down next to her while she was going to sleep and took her face in my hands. And she said, I'm ready to go and be with Jesus. I know that's where she is. I mean, what can you say to that? Literally, other than I love you. So I laid down next to her and held her hand. 4.30 in the morning, we hear that chirping sound that a dead battery makes in a smoke alarm. So I got up in the dark, went out, got the ladder. I had the, I already had a battery up. Went back in, changed the battery. I went 
back out, took the ladder, put it away, went and got back in bed. And I laid there for a minute, and I thought, it's awfully quiet next to me. I turned the light on, and it was obvious Stephanie had passed. The impact Stephanie had on so many people, and it was love. She'd go down to Solanus Casey, you know, at the Caption Center, and they had, every Wednesday, they had a blessing of the sick. Well, Stephanie, they'd have 40 to 100 people there every Wednesday. Stephanie would always wait to be the last one blessed. And then she would see who was left sitting around, and she'd find somebody that needed her prayers. Don't ask me how. There could be 10 people there, and she'd be drawn to one, and she'd go up and ask them if she could pray with or for them. It's always a yes. Quite frankly, the funeral and all that, I was on my feet eight hours the day before, and then if you it's just kind of like a blur, except for one reading her daughter made, and it had to do with remember me. And the gist of it was, go where I went, listen to the music I listened to, eat what I ate, and say my name. It's going to hurt. And then after a while, it won't hurt some more. And then it, I'll just be left in your heart. And after all the grief, you're just left with love. So thankful for Bruce telling that story. And Bruce and Stephanie have just been incredible servants at Kensington for decades. And just that expression of love, and it was real. Stephanie just lived her life for Jesus, full tilt, until her last breath. And I thought, that's how I, I want to do the same. Don't you? Because this is not, this is going to happen. But because we know we have an eternal picture that far outweighs the suffering, we can do it with hope and joy. And in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of the world that's broken, we can see God moving in people's lives. We can see God's blessings along the way. Um, one of my closest friends, uh, mother-in-law died this week. She was an incredible woman. I got. To, have several conversations with her as a younger man. We were in college. And Jim Van Iperen, one of my Wheaton buddies, uh, there's a group of us that played football together, Wheaton College. Of course, you know, Wheaton College is, whenever I say Wheaton College, you remember, you're supposed to say football powerhouse of the Midwest. And uh, it's funny. They actually laugh. My buddies actually laugh at that a lot harder than you do. We, we were kind of a joke, but... He sent me this quote by George McDonald. And George McDonald is hugely influential for Paula and me in our life, his writings, his love for Christ. He was born in 1824, died in 1905. And most of his novels were written in kind of in a Scottish brogue. But in the kind of the mid 20th centuries, people started rewriting them in more contemporary English so you could read them. But he's just an amazing man. But Jim and Eichmann sent me this quote by George MacDonald. And George and his wife, Lillian, had, I think it was Lillian, had, eight, had 11 children. But he watched five of his children die of tuberculosis. So what I'm going to read to you is not some armchair quarterback that never knew what suffering was. He knew the depth of despair. And so here it is. I'm, I'm hoping it will mean as much to you as it means to me. Some of you might even want to take a picture when you see it up on the screen and to read it later, but here we go. George McDonald writes this. He says, on either hand, we behold a birth of which as the moon, we see but half. And to the region where she goes, the woman enters newly born. We forget that it is a birth and call it death. As the childbed is watched on earth, 
with anxious expectancy. So the couch of the dying, as we call it, may be surrounded by birth watchers of the other world, waiting like anxious servants to open the door to which this world is but the windblown porch. If you wanna ask me why I don't get down with everything I see that just disturbs me, how I see people facing the most terrible suffering, they know that their life is like this little dot on the string of eternity. We're on, we're on the windblown porch right now. And the people that you love and when you pass on, you've gotta realize Hebrews 12 says, we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses the church of the firstborn, an uncountable number of angels, Hebrews 12 writes about, that are all in the presence of Jesus as Jesus intercedes for us, calling us home. Birth watchers, opening the door to a new world. Now listen, either that's true or it's not. If it's not true, then all of us who believe it are just a bunch of stupid morons. But if it is true, if Jesus really did defeat the grave, if Jesus' love and strength, if God's grace and mercy covers the brokenness of this world, if everything is gonna be made new someday, then we can face whatever comes with joy and with hope of the birth that is coming. Let's pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you for this vision of what our lives can be. And Lord, I think of all those that have gone on before us, the watchers surrounding the throne. And Lord, knowing someday we'll behold your glory, we'll see your face, and we'll see you put all things together in a way that we'd love to see and we're going to fight for here but someday all together put together and right thank you in Jesus name
some of his promises. Every single one of his promises are yes and amen. They are as true now as they were the first time he spoke them. And to be a little bit vulnerable right now, this is a weird season in my life. We're, in a, we're, we're farming right now and everything's going a little chaotic and we're losing animals left and right and we can't figure it out why and, and we know it's gonna get better. But in this season, he's constantly reminding me, hey, I didn't promise you that your life was gonna be easy. But what I do promise you is that I'm never gonna leave you or forsake you. I'm never going, I'm, I'm gonna continually walk next to you and be beside you and carry you through the times that aren't so easy. And when I reflect on that and remember that, it's easy to it's easier to move forward and to keep going and to build resilience. And so that's what we get, to, we get to hold on to and that's what we get to celebrate when we sing that. So let's sing that one more time together. Sing, I will rest. I will rest in your promises, my confidence. Is your faithfulness, oh, I will rest in your promises, my confidence. Is your faithfulness, sing, I will rest. Come on, you sing it. In your promises, my confidence, oh, it's your faithfulness. I will rest in your promises, my confidence. Oh, it's your faithfulness. Oh, I will rest in your promises, my confidence. Yes, Jesus, it's your faithfulness. Faithfulness is faithful. 
great to be here today and just think again of God's faithfulness. And um, for some of you that are really struggling, one of the things that I, in my times where I felt the deepest darkness, I was, I've always been drawn to the Psalms and they're incredible. Each one will speak to you in a powerful way, but I was thinking of Psalm 30 this morning to finish. And Lord, I called you for help. You healed me. You brought me up from the realm of the dead. He spared me from going down to the pit. For his anger lasts only a moment, his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. This is how we live with hope. And as you walk out of here, last 30 second story. So Saturday night, two weeks ago, we buried our, our dog and family and you know, the house is so empty without him. And then very next day I get up, I spoke at Birmingham and could barely get through it. And then Sunday night, we're just sitting there and we're just, Paul and I were grieving so hard. And then about 10 o'clock, we get a phone call, it's Lindy. She goes, I think I'm going into labor. We're like, George the dog who? You know, <laughs> we're jumping in the car and running and she and Cam left early because the baby was coming and at 1.43, Monday morning, uh, Helen Elizabeth was born a little bit early, but she's wonderful. But I thought it was a, it's a microcosm of our lives that we know the sorrow is there, but the joy is coming. I think we can believe that Jesus' promises, as Matthias said, can be trusted along the way. Don't you? So let's do that along the way. If you need prayer, there'll be people down here to pray in front. We got a great series coming up for July so fun to be with you guys. Love you and see you soon.